So hi everybody and welcome back for another week of marketing. Um, this week we've spent a lot of time talking about some of the other P's, uh, specifically the product P. But now we're going to move on to talk about the price P here. Um, and this is uh, one of two weeks that we'll spend on this price P. Um, but I think you'll really enjoy this. Um, and it, honestly, the price P is one of the most important elements of the marketing mix because you know, every other element can be in place, it can be perfect, but if the price of your product is wrong, you're, you're not gonna have the sales and the revenue that you really need or maybe want it, okay? Um, lots of times when we're talking about price, people think, oh, it's, it's just money, it's just money. Um, it's not all about the dollar sign. Price is the, our book defines it as the overall sacrifice that a consumer is willing to make in order to acquire a specific product or a specific service. So remember, it can be monetary or it can be non-monetary. I think that might even be one of your quiz questions this week. Okay, so um, the other really interesting thing about the price P is that it's the only element of the marketing mix that does not generate cost, uh, but rather instead actually generates revenue for the company. So um, pretty exciting stuff. Price is also the number one factor in most consumers' purchase decisions. We all care about price, right? Um, it, likewise, it's also probably the most challenging of any of the four Ps to manage, uh, a lot of time because it's it's the least understood of the Ps. So we're going to spend some time making sure we're able to delve through why this happens. Um, sadly, a lot of times competitors just set prices uh, or companies, excuse me, just set prices based on what their competitors are charging or sometimes they just calculate their cost of what it's going to cost them and they say, oh, I want to make this much money extra and boom, they set their price. And it just doesn't always um, work that way. It's not quite that simple. So we actually have some, some cool pricing tactics we're going to learn about today and some different orientations we'll talk about. So uh, I want to start just by saying that marketers should always view pricing as a strategic opportunity. And of course, we view everything in marketing as an opportunity to create value. Uh, it should never just be an afterthought to the rest of the marketing mix. Oh, we have this product, we've got it, we have our promotion plan, we're good, and oh, let's set a price. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. It should always be a strategic opportunity to create value. Um, so one way that we help structure this process to make it sort of easy to, easy to follow and make sure we know what we're doing, uh, we have the five C's of pricing. Okay, and this is this is how we build a successful marketing strategy, um, uh, talking about price. Okay, so the five C's of pricing. Um, we're going to look through each of these C's individually. That's actually all that our this little uh, video presentation is about is just the five C's. Okay, we're going to start though with company objectives. So I'm going to kind of hop around from these five. We're going to start here with company objectives, and it's important to remember that um, a company can can have a different objective. Every different company is different, right? So we all have different goals, we all want different things, and thus we need to have different pricing strategies. Uh, a lot of times a firm strategy might be something like to increase profits or maybe to increase sales, uh, to decrease competition, to build customer satisfaction. Um, that being said, these are not mutually exclusive. Okay, so you can have two or more non-competing objectives and that's okay. Uh, they just have to be non-competing. So for example, um, I want to increase profits and I also want to increase sales. Okay, those kind of go hand in hand, right? Um, so there's different pricing orientations. There's four that we're going to talk about that kind of fall under these company objectives. Uh, the first is a profit orientation. Okay, one of four, profit orientation. And this is exactly what it sounds like. This is when a company is focused on making a profit. And there's a few different um, pricing tactics that we take. Um, a firm can be involved in target profit pricing, um, just want to maximize profits, or target return pricing. And there's actually a mathematical formula for each of these. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these um, because your book does go into a lot of detail on this, but it is something that you can look through and familiarize yourself with. Uh, very briefly, I will just say that Target profit pricing is whenever a firm has a certain profit goal that they're trying to, to meet. Um, so I want to make $50,000 on this transaction or, or on uh, this year, this month, whatever it might be. Um, a good example of this is oh, I want to see an 18% return on investment. Firms typically turn to this target return pricing and employ these 
pricing strategies that are designed to produce a specific return on their investment. So usually, again, as a percentage of sales or a specific ROI, that's how you know that a firm is usually engaging in target return pricing. Okay, so that's a little bit of all I'm going to say about profit, the profit orientation. Again, you can read more details in your book. More than anything, I just want you to be familiar with these different types of orientations. Um, our next orientation, this is probably my favorite one, is the sales orientation. And this is whenever a firm sets prices, um, really believing that these increasing sales are going to be more helpful to the firm than increasing profits. And that sounds a little crazy, so let me give you some examples of why this might matter. Okay, this is really common with gyms when they first open. So, um, you know, a, a brand new gym wants to bring lots of membership because over time, the more people they have, the more revenue they're going to have. So they might be willing to offer initially a really low membership fee and accept less profits in the beginning, uh, knowing that once they get that volume through unit sales, they're going to eventually generate the profit that they need. Uh, likewise, they may decide later they want to increase the price and generate profit that way, which is sadly more and more common these days. Um, on the flip side of that, a higher-end jewelry store might really be focused on having this prestige image, so they might actually maintain higher prices and focus more on the dollar amount of each sale um, with the whole mentality that, hey, if we sell fewer units, that's okay, we still have higher sales because you know, you're paying $50,000 for this diamond or whatever, okay? Um, and something else that's becoming more and more common in our society today is that a firm may actually set lower prices just to discourage new firms from entering the market, or maybe they want to try to discourage firms that are already in the market to leave, and they try to kind of steal market share from competitors. Um, so having this sales orientation strategy where you're just focused on getting sales and less focused on dollars can be um, really, really important and also kind of dangerous. <laughs> um, this leads me to our, our next topic on premium pricing. Um, and I want to point out something that most of you guys will probably agree with, but rarely do you see the lowest price offering being the dominant brand in a given market. Okay, um, so a lot of firms will engage in what is called premium pricing, and this is where we deliberately set our prices above the prices of our competition uh, because we're, we're kind of focusing on that target group of customers who always shop for the best product, or maybe they just don't care about price. It's not an issue, okay? Um, some examples are um, Nike products, like Nike shoes, okay? If you want a cheaper shoe, you can go to Walmart and buy a generic brand shoe, okay? But if you want really nice, comfortable running shoes, you probably buy Nike shoes, uh, maybe Adidas. Um, Philadelphia cream cheese, you can buy the generic brand cream cheese, but maybe you always buy Philadelphia, or maybe your mom says, oh, we only buy Kraft cheese, or we only buy the Heinz brand of ketchup, we won't buy the off brand, or we only buy Crest toothpaste. Okay, you, you might have those certain things that you, you, you always buy the name brand, you always buy uh, the dominant brand in the given market, and usually that dominant brand is not the lowest price, surprisingly. So premium pricing is something to be aware of. This is something you'll see this week in your marketing application response. Um, okay, so we've talked a little bit about the profit orientation and the sales orientation. Let's talk a little bit more about this competition or competitor orientation. Okay, and um, this is where obviously we're looking at the competition, hence why we call it the competitor orientation. Wow, marketers are creative people, right? Um, so we strategize by comparing ourselves against our competition, and a lot of times the focus here is on undercutting competitors. So um, we have what we call competitive variety competitive priority, excuse me, where firms will set prices that are really similar to their competition. So, oh, okay, and a Nike running shoe is $80, Adidas is going to charge $79, or maybe we'll charge $82, okay? Um, we also have what we call status quo pricing, which is very common. Uh, this is where firms change prices only because they're trying to stay in line with the competition. So you see this a lot in the flight industry. If you've ever booked a flight for yourself, you will go online at 2 o'clock and look at flights to Rome, Italy today, and you will go um, online tomorrow at 2 o'clock and look at flights to Rome, Italy, and you will see a $200 difference in the price just for no apparent reason. Well, uh, a lot of times this is because of status quo pricing where 
one company, say Delta, they raise the cost of their average flight. So the other companies, American Airlines, United, whoever it is, they raise their prices too. Uh, and then a week later, Delta decides, oh, we're going to lower our prices. And then the others follow suit as well. So there's money to be made in that interim time period where flights are changing. You look one minute and, oh, Delta is $300 cheaper than American Airlines. We're going to uh, we're going to go with them or, oh, you know, you get uh, first class seating with this one for the same price. We're going to go with that one. It's just a little bit more. Uh, we're going to do that. So, you know, you a lot is to be said about this competitor orientation. Uh, next, our last orientation we're going to talk about is the customer orientation. And this is a, an important thing to think about. Uh, this is where we set all of our pricing strategy based on how we can add value to our products and to our services um, really thinking about our customers and what they need. So uh, CarMax is a great example of this. They promise this no haggle pricing structure. When you think about buying a car, you think about, oh gosh, the stress, I'm going to have to nag, I better bring somebody with me, oh gosh, I'm going to take my dad because dad's mean, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, you're, you're stressed about it. Whereas CarMax, they promise this no haggle pricing structure, which even if you have to pay a little bit more or whatever, oh, they have a set cost, um, and that gives a lot of additional value to consumers because it makes the process less stressful. It's easy. It's simple. You know this is what you're going to pay. Uh, I think back to whenever I bought my first vehicle post-graduation. I bought a Toyota Highlander, uh, and I drove all the way to Statesville, North Carolina to go to Flow Toyota because they, uh, they sold used vehicles, and there was no haggle on them. And it was also $10,000 cheaper than Tennessee. So it was like, hey, let's do that for sure. But I knew that there would be no haggle pricing. I knew it would be very simple and easy just to go there and buy the car and drive home. That's what I did. Customer orientation. It's important sometimes. Okay, those are our four orientations. So we talked about company objectives and, and those orientations that fall uh, a lot of times with those company objectives. Next, we're going to talk about the next C of pricing, which is customers. And again, I'm, I'm hopping out of order here, but you'll, you'll see why in a moment. So... A lot of times we really do care about customers. Wow, right? Because we want them to buy our products. Um, so, and sometimes this is as simple as just basic economic theory, basic supply and demand, okay? Um, so I, I'm gonna take a step back for a moment and take you back to the world of economics. Uh, we've all taken economics, obviously. That was a prereq for this class. So, uh, but I always like to do just a little, quick little review, just so we're all on the same page, okay? So a demand curve, it tells us how many units of a product or a service customers will demand during a specific time period. And the general rule of thumb that um, is true in most marketing cases is that as the price of a product increases, the demand for that product or you know for that service, if we're talking about services, the demand for that product or service decreases. So again, as price goes up, demand goes down. Uh, but the opposite is true. As prices decrease, the demand for the product actually increases, okay? Think about that. If, if the price of something is going up and up and up, do you want to buy it? Probably not. But if, oh gosh, this is on sale, the price is going down and down and down, let's buy it, okay? So I think this is kind of common sense. Um, here's a demand curve for teeth whitening. Think about like crest white strips, okay? You can see as demand increases, price decreases. So this downward sloping demand curve is kind of the norm. But not all products follow this demand curve. We also um, can think about prestige products or prestige services. So uh, not many people want to spend $300,000 on a handbag. Um, but some people do purchase for status and the status symbol that it conveys rather than for functionality. So a lot of times you may see um, you know, a product like this, a prestige product that does not follow the demand curve, the downward sloping demand curve. Um, and something that's important to notice here is that with a lot of prestige products, a higher price may lead to a greater quantity sold, but only to a certain point. And I always like to take the example of a luxury vacation, okay? So think about your average cost of what you're paying for a vacation. Maybe you pay $1,000, maybe you pay 5000 whatever it is. Um, when you think about the price of the vacation going up from $1,000 to $2,000, the quantity demanded is still increasing here as the price increases. So we go up from 200,000 units to 500,000 units as our price increases from 1,000 to 5,000. Okay, so we see demand is increasing here on this slope as the price is also increasing. 
Okay, but it does level out at a certain point. When the price hits $8,000, the demand actually decreases back down to only 300,000 units. And you can see that here with this line. Okay, so when the price was $8,000 for a vacation, uh, that's a little steep, right? We might not want to pay that much. Okay, so this is counterintuitive because it seems that even though unit sales are decreasing, um, we think the firm might actually make a greater profit selling 300,000 units at $8,000 rather than selling 500,000 units at $5,000. Um, but we don't know until we actually calculate all the costs and all the details of that. But hopefully you can see here just how important this demand curve is in marketing. Um, and here in just a second, we're going to learn how to do the math. It's not as simple as just multiplying these together, unfortunately. Uh, but you will learn um, shortly as time goes on how to calculate these costs and look at the units and see how all of this blends together, okay? But for the time being, I just want you to sort of see the difference here. Generally, it is true that as demand increases, price increases. As demand decreases, price um, also increases. You can kind of see these things to be true um, in certain cases, but not always. So that's why it's important to look at this demand curve. I want you, as you're doing your assignments this week, to think about this downward sloping demand curve. This is the one we're gonna be using the majority of the time for most of your assignments. Um, as demand increases, price decreases. Just think about the customer. Um, if the price of a product is going down, which is where you want to buy it, whereas um, the opposite of that is not true. So think about those. We will look at some peculiar examples like this, but I want you to keep it in the basics for now. Um, okay, so I also want to talk about price changes because as marketers, we're always thinking about this. And typically, we see sensitivity in pricing for a lot of customers, but the level of sensitivity varies according to the specific product or service that we're talking about. Okay, so for necessity items like gas or milk or uh, bread, you know, those kind of staple items, we're usually less sensitive because we have to we have to purchase the product. No matter what, we have to have gas in our cars. We have to buy milk and bread. You know, you have certain things that you just must have to survive, right? Um, so we're less sensitive to those kind of price changes, which is why we see gas skyrocketing at the moment. Um, so... For other products, like say a steak, um, when there are substitutes available, we tend to be more sensitive to those kind of price changes and we might not buy that. So um, we're gonna talk a little more about some details with this in a moment, but think about a steak. You know, if, if the price of steak is really rising, it's getting more and more expensive, but hey, there's substitutes out there. We could buy chicken, we could buy chicken, we could buy fish, we could even buy ground beef, right? There's other options available. So when there's substitutes, we are more sensitive to these price changes. Um, this is where the price elasticity of demand comes into play. And this price elasticity of demand essentially just measures changes in price and how these changes in price affect the quantity of the product demanded. We do have a formula that we use. It's the change in quantity demanded divided by the change in price. And I have an example for you here going back to our Crest White Strips, our teeth whitening products. Um, so if we're trying to calculate this price elasticity of demand to determine, hey, is this elastic or is it inelastic? Do we care about prices? Are our customers price sensitive or are they not price sensitive? So as we're filling in our formula here, uh, remember it is Q2 uh, minus Q1 divided by Q1 for our numerator here. So as we look at Q2, we find the number five. So look at Q1, we find the number 10, subtract these out, get negative five. We're dividing this by Q1 again uh, with a total of 10. So negative five divided by 10 gives us negative one half or negative 50% as our numerator. As we look at the change in price, we're taking P2 minus P1 divided by P1. So we do our math accordingly, 15 minus 10 divided by 10 is 5 tenths, or 1 half, again 50%. So we get negative 50 divided by 50 is negative 1. Great, so we have negative 1, now what? Well, as you look at this, we can determine that if the number that we get from this equation, once we work it all out, if this number is less than negative 1, then in this case, our product is elastic, meaning that our customers are going to be price sensitive, okay, in, in terms of this particular product. 
So again, as we think back about T-bone steaks, raising the price in this case would probably result in less T-bone steak sales if T-bone steaks are elastic. Okay. Now, if that number that we get from solving that equation is greater than negative one, then in this case, our product is inelastic, meaning that um, we're not as sensitive to these price changes. Okay, so this is just something to consider from a marketing standpoint as you are setting your prices. Um, I have a couple of sample problems here for you to try. You can do this on your own time. These are in the PowerPoints. It will show you step by step the answers, how to get them by each step, and you can see if you got it right. Okay, but for the purpose of this video, I just want you to know um, that when a product is elastic, consumers are usually price sensitive, whereas when a product is inelastic, we are um, insensitive to price. We care less about that. Okay. Um, and this is pretty obvious. We're less sensitive when it comes to things like necessities that we have to have. Okay. Uh, this leads me also to talk about the income effect. And this is something else marketers have to consider. Okay. Because the change in the quantity of a product demanded by consumers um, usually changes according to their incomes. And, and this is kind of common sense. As someone's income increases, our spending behavior usually changes. The more money we make, the more money we spend. Okay, so if our income increases, we might even shift from buying, um, we might stop buying those lower priced products and start buying some higher priced alternatives. We might stop buying the generic brand, the store brand, and maybe buy, um, you know, the name brand. Um, whereas the opposite is true if our income decreases. So if we start losing some of our income, we look at less expensive alternatives, maybe we buy less than before. Um, and I put on here, think about steak and hamburger. So if you are doing really well this month and you're making a lot of money, oh, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to buy a steak and I'm going to get all this stuff to go with it. It's going to be great. Or, oh my gosh, I have $10 in my bank account. I should probably buy something a little cheaper. Okay. So you can go through and, uh, conceptualize this pretty easily based on, uh, one's income. Something else to think about is the substitution effect, and this has always been really interesting to me, but um, the substitution effect, we refer to consumers' ability to substitute other products for the focal brand. So an example is laundry detergent. Okay, this is a, an area where there are a lot of substitutes available. So if Tide, the very common laundry detergent brand, if Tide raises their prices, Sometimes people will just buy Arm & Hammer or Gain or whatever other alternative, whereas loyal Tide customers, those people who are brand loyal, they're going to pay the higher price because they really like Tide. So the substitution effect is something to think about here as you're setting your prices. Uh, this also brings me to cross-price elasticity. And this is also um, something where we have to think about complements and substitutes. Okay, so when you think about complement goods or those things that go together, uh, the demand for complement goods are usually positively related. So that means they rise together and they also fall together. So think about peanut butter and jelly. Okay, if the demand for peanut butter increases, then the quantity demanded of jelly is probably also going to increase. On this slide, I talk about Blu-rays, uh, Blu-ray disc and Blu-ray players. So if the demand for a Blu-ray disc increases, then the quantity demanded of Blu-ray players is also probably going to increase. Okay, um, now when we think about substitute goods where there are a lot of other options available, um, the opposite is true here. So um, think about, again, Blu-ray players and DVD players. So as the quantity demanded for Blu-ray players starts to go up, um, there's a decrease in the quantity demanded for DVD players. So these things are negatively related. And this kind of makes sense, right? As we start to evolve and we start to uh, buy Blu-rays, uh, we don't need as many DVD players because everything's being made on Blu-ray now, right? So when there are substitutes available, you see these changes in demand affect products negatively. Okay, so we're, we're halfway through, guys. We've talked about our company objectives, we've talked about our customers. Now we're going to move on to talk about cost, and this is something that I think is also pretty easily, easily conceptualized. Um, now, this is where companies really start to struggle, right? Because you're a business owner, you think, oh, I'm going to set my price based on how much it costs, right? Because I want to make a profit and I don't want to just set the price somewhere where, hey, I'm breaking even. Well, in, in a lot of cases, that's true. Um, 
But remember that consumers actually make their purchase decisions based on the perceived value of a product. Okay, they don't care how much it costs you as the business owner to um, produce and sell this product or deliver a certain service. They could care less. All they care about is their perceived value of the product. So I want you to think about this from the consumer standpoint as we're talking about cost today. All right, so there's two types of costs that we're going to talk about. Again, this is probably a review for you from micro or macroeconomics, but uh, the two types of costs we're going to look at here are variable and fixed cost. Um, our variable costs are those that vary with production volume. Uh, you usually see this with labor and materials. Uh, and I use the example of a hotel here and also of a bakery. So uh, Blackbird Bakery, they incur all kinds of variable cost uh, when it comes to ingredients. So every time they make a cake or some kind of dessert, they have to use sugar, they have to use flour, they have to pay an employee to be there working in the kitchen. Uh, the same is true with a hotel. So maybe a hotel incurs approximately $10 of variable cost for each room that they um, rent for the night. And that $10 may cover the cost of cleaning staff, maybe stocking the room with shampoo and conditioner, coffee, uh, whatever it is. Um, and these variable costs may go up or down depending on the volume. So it depends on how many cakes Blackbird sells. It depends on how many rooms this hotel rents per night. Okay. Um, whereas fixed cost, um, those are the same regardless of our changes in volume. So this is, uh, think about, again, going back to the bakery, Blackbird Bakery, regardless of whether they make 100,000 desserts or 1 million desserts, they're paying, they're paying the same rent um, regardless, okay? Regardless of how many desserts they make, whether they sell one, one million, or zero, they're going to pay $3,000 a month in rent or whatever, okay? Um, usually see these fixed costs in terms of rent, utilities, insurance, salaries, um, depreciation, those kind of things. So we, of course, look at total costs as the sum of these two numbers, the sum of variable and fixed cost. Um, a lot of times these are not always given to you in real life like they are in a handy-dandy math problem. A lot of times you have to go and calculate these and that requires a lot of number crunching, which you math people will love. Okay, but this is an important part of marketing as well. So again, going back to a hotel, a hotel that incurs um, $100 in fixed costs, and they booked 10,000 rooms with a variable cost of $10 per room. If you can go and add these together, 10,000 rooms times $10 each gives you 100,000 plus the 100,000 in fixed cost gives you $200,000 in total cost. So pretty easy to um, calculate all of these numbers. Now, why do we care about calculating all these numbers? Well, we care um, because in marketing, we start to look at break-even points, and we look at the break-even analysis, okay? Uh, and this break-even analysis essentially just shows us the exact point where the number of units sold generates just enough revenue to equal the total cost. This is where profits are $0.00, and, zero cents. and there's a visual here somewhere that I'll show you in a second. I think it's a few slides down, but I'll show you the visual where these, these immediately break. Um, so we calculate our break-even point by taking our fixed cost and dividing our contribution per unit. Well, you're looking at me going, oh my gosh, what's a contribution per unit? Okay, so our contribution per unit is where we, we take the price and we subtract out the variable cost per unit. And this, um, this is used as the uh, denominator um, below fixed cost. So think about the hotel again. If you know that a hotel's fixed costs are $100,000, keeping that number we've been going with. Take the $100,000 here as your numerator and divide out your contribution per unit. So we know that the hotel rents for $50 a night. We know there's a variable cost of $10 um, per room there. So we take $50, we subtract $10, we get $40. Uh, using that as our denominator, we take $100,000 divided by $40, and we get 2,500 rooms that we have to break even with. Okay, oh, here's that chart. So you can see right here the 2,500 rooms. Anything more we sell, if we sell 2,501 rooms, boom, we made a profit. If we sold 10,000 rooms, boom, we made a profit. But if we sell 2,499 rooms, uh-oh, we have a loss, okay? So you can go through and calculate these. Um, these are just some key equations you're going to use. You have these available to you to reference as you're doing the assignments and the quiz. 
Um, again, there are some sample questions for you that you can go through and practice here. If you'd like some more practice for that, it does give you the answer. Um, we also look at target pricing. We talked about this earlier. So if you know um, that you're that hotel owner and you don't just want to break even, right? You want to make money. Okay, so let's say you want to make $200,000 in profit every single year that your hotel is open. We have an equation for that too. It's a break-even point along with this target profit. So we essentially take that equation we had before and we just add the target profit to it. So again, our fixed costs are $100,000. We know we want to make $200,000. So as our numerator, instead of using $100,000, we use $300,000. Our contribution per unit is the same as before, $50.00. Um, as our selling price of the room per night minus our $10 variable cost gives us $40. We take that $300,000 and divide by 40. And now we have to sell 7,500 rooms in order to break even with our break even point, including that $200,000 in profit. Okay, uh, this is something that's used commonly in real estate as well, in real estate transactions. Okay. Um, again, I, I gave you a sample here to try if you want to try that on your own, see if you get the right answer. It works it out with the math just to help you there if you're interested. Um, okay, so we've talked about three of the C's. Moving on to competition. This is pretty uh, pretty dicey here, and this is one of your topics this week and your write-up as well. One of my favorite things to talk about, actually. But um, there's four levels of competition that we look at. And this is, um, obviously, you probably know about monopolies. Uh, we also have... Um, monopolistic competition, pure competition, and oligopolistic competition, um, coming from the word oligopoly, which for me is a whole lot easier to say than oligopolistic. Really have to practice that. Um, okay, so uh, when we think about Monopoly, if you've ever played the board game Monopoly, you know that you usually win that game because by the time you get to the end, the winner owns everything and has all the money. Okay, so same thing here with Monopoly in the sense of a business. Um, a monopoly is created when one firm provides the product or service in a certain industry, um, which is usually has less price competition. We see this a lot with our water, our electric, a lot of those utilities. Um, depending on where you live, you sometimes just have one person you can pay for your water. You have no other choice. If they decide to hike up the price $50 a month, you have to pay it because you have a monopoly. Same thing with electricity. Sometimes you have one, maybe two companies to choose from, but generally they're pretty neck and neck and you have to pay those prices. So, a monopoly. Um, oligopolistic competition is when only a few firms dominate. Um, and I use the example of TV and also airlines here. So in my area, we have a limited um, amount of TV companies to choose from when we're thinking about cable. Now, I'm cheap. I don't have cable. I just Netflix and Amazon Prime. But for people in my area who do watch TV, um, you can choose from Comcast, Charter, or Dish Network. Those are really your three options. And honestly, all of them are pretty close in price uh, because of this oligopolistic competition. It's going to be expensive no matter where you go. Okay, um, Airlines are the same thing. You can choose between Delta, United, and American Airlines. Again, um, they change their prices in order to react to the competition um, to sort of create um, a little bit of instability in the market. So pretty interesting how that works. Um, so so going, continuing this um, discussion on oligopolistic competition, a lot of times whenever you have just a few firms in the market, um, you see a price war that comes about. So um, if you think about TV again, okay, Charter decides they're going to lower its prices. Comcast decides, well, hey, I'm going to meet up with that. I will beat their price. I'll beat Charter's price. I'm going to go lower. And then Fermi says, oh, well, uh, Charter, um, no, I'm, I'm going to go even lower than Comcast to keep you as a customer. So they just keep going down and down and down and down and down. It's the cyclical cycle, which for the customer is great, okay, because your, your prices are going down, you're paying less. But from a business standpoint, you can't stay in a price war forever. You're going to lose profits. You're going to lose prices. It's bad news bears, okay? You just can't keep doing that forever and ever. Um, we also have um, what we call predatory pricing, which is actually illegal in the United States under the Sherman Act and also the Federal Trade Commission Act. But um, predatory pricing still happens, sadly, and predatory pricing is when a firm sets a price super, super low for one or more of its products, just intentionally trying to drive out competition. 
So they know, oh, if I offer this for free, there's no way this other company is going to stay in business. Or I'll offer it for $1. Uh, it goes as low and low and low as possible. Predatory pricing. Um, monopolistic competition occurs a lot with um, products that are differentiated. Okay, and I always think about sunglasses. I love sunglasses. I'm, you know, you've heard of people who have tons of shoes. I'm a sunglass person. Okay, so um, this monopolistic competition occurs when there are a lot of different firms that are competing for customers in a given market with differentiated products. So when you think about sunglasses, um, sure, there's all different prices, there's all different designs, all different styles. Um, you have Ray-Ban, you have Oakley, Prada, Burberry, Gucci, whatever it is. But when all these firms are competing, um, it's the product differentiation rather than the price differentiation that really appeals to customers, okay? Because whether you're shopping for Ray-Bans or Oakleys or Burberry sunglasses, whatever it is, they're all going to be expensive, okay? So it's the different designs and the different styles and all the different little cool things. You can get the, the glasses that automatically turn um, when you go outside and come back in when you're inside. They have all kinds of cool things. You can buy the kind that have the UV rays that protect your eyes, the ones that don't. Uh, there's all kinds of cool stuff you can buy with sunglasses. And in this case, um, it's the products that are differentiated rather than the price. So that's monopolistic competition. We also have pure competition, and this is where um, the product is standard. Okay, so this is common with grains and gold, meat, spices, minerals. Um, and if you think about wheat, for example, okay, wheat is wheat. It doesn't matter where you buy it or from whom you buy it. Um, wheat is wheat. So the secret here is not just to offer the lowest price. That would give you a price for You'd be fighting, going down and down and down. Nobody would ever make any money. Okay, so when you have pure competition, we don't care so much about um, the price of the product. We care more about differentiating your product from others. So the example, that, the example here that I thought of was salt. Uh, Morton Salt has been in business for ages, right? And you may and your family always purchase Morton Salt just because that's what your parents did or whatever. But we know Morton Salt. We've, we're familiar with them. They've differentiated themselves with a the logo, with a the sticker. They're distinct from the rest. It's not just the cheapo brand you buy. We know Morton Salt's good quality, and it's still not expensive. Okay, so the goal here is to differentiate your product with some kind of logo, some kind of sticker, something to make it distinct from the rest. That's how you're successful in a market where there's pure competition. Okay, so we've gotten through four of these Cs. We talked about the company objectives, customers, cost, and competition. Uh, we're going to finish, wrap up today by talking about channel members. Um, and, and this is pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to say a lot here. But this is where we look at wholesalers, manufacturers, retailers. They all have different perspectives on pricing strategies. Okay, And this is where there can be some turmoil that's created. So maybe a manufacturer wants to increase the image and the reputation of its brand, whereas a retailer wants to increase sales and clear out their shelves so they can make a profit. So unless each of these channel members very clearly and very carefully communicate their pricing goals and select partners that agree with them, you're going to have some conflict that arises. So it's really important to make sure all the channel members are on the same page here. Okay. Um, all right. That is the end of our presentation this week. I hope you guys have a great week. As always, if you have any questions at all about your assignment or the quiz or um, anything at all, feel free to shoot me an email. I would be glad to um, help you with anything you need. So I hope you guys have a great week and I will talk to you soon.